So today we're going to be talking with Professor um, Mary Jo Sharp, and she has been involved with Houston Baptist Apologetics Program for quite a while, and she has so much to share with us, especially for this particular class for apologetics research and writing. Um, and so we're just really blessed to have her with us today. Um, I'll let her introduce herself, and um, then we'll kind of go over there talking about um, writing for a popular audience. <laughs> yeah. So um, I have. I am. Um, not a traditional academic. I actually began a ministry entitled Confident Christianity in 2006. And it first started as a blog in defense of the resurrection, and then it became an organization in uh, 2008. Uh, so m most of the time I was arguing as it developed for the existence of the Christian God, and it was basically on several internet platforms. But I was also helping two other um, Christians, David Wood and Nabil Qureshi, with their public formal debates. So organizing those and um, putting those together, advertising them. I you know, did timekeeping, moderating, and then eventually moved into debating. The guys kind of pushed me along into doing debates myself. So the blog and the debates and the online engagement all led to public speaking and also to publishing opportunities. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is, so that's important to understand like the beginnings because that is where the publishing opportunities came from. And in um, 2012, I released my first two popular level works. One was a book on apologetics and women's ministry called Defending the Faith. And then um, there was a Lifeway Christian Resources Bible study called Why Do You Believe That? And since that time, I've consistently written books, articles, studies, and or contributed to a whole bunch of collections up to the present. So my most recent book being Why I Still Believe, Former Atheist Reckoning with a Bad Reputation, Christians Give a Good God. Good. So that's sort of the background. Um, <laughs> if you want to know like why I'm a professor, I completed my master's degree in apologetics as of tw uh, 2008 with a master's thesis in the copycat theory of the Christman theory, the copycat aspect of it. And I'm currently involved in my PhD work in epistemology. So uh, <laughs> that's sort of the background. Um, I'm an assistant professor here at HBU, and I was one of the original trio of uh, women who were hired to develop, create, and implement the apologetics degree. So I've developed several courses and taught many others uh, since my time from, I, I was hired in 2012. So there's a little bit of my background. Thanks so much for that, Professor Sharp. Um, we'll move on and we'll kind of start talking about just these questions more practically, practically speaking. Um, so when we talk about a popular audience, how would you define that? Um, and then what do you see specifically as the goal for writing for a popular audience? Oh, yeah. Um, so for, for me, like looking at what a popular audience is, which I actually never sat and just thought about it, but it's referring to um, when you make a general appeal or an appeal, sorry, to the general public. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's more helpful in defining um, what a popular audience is by saying what it's not. So it is not an academic audience. Uh, you're not writing for people who generally have studied and understand your particular area of scholarship. So rather you're appealing to sort of a broader group of people to introduce them to your ideas uh, in your field. And these people are gonna come from a vast range of studies, trades, and skills. So they, they're generally people who will be interested in your subject, but they're just not experts in that um, particular area. And that, I, that relates over to the goal. What's the goal for writing? Oh, there's so many goals. <laughs> but like a lot of times it's because you have, you know, you really feel like God's placed something on your heart that you want to communicate. Um, another thing is that, another reason is that like for me, I wanted to introduce um, specifically women's ministries because I saw there were so many of them across the United States in particular. I wanted to introduce them to this idea of apologetics, what this field was, and um, I wanted to do it in a way in which they would not feel intimidated. And I think one of the goals of writing for a popular audience is to expose them to bigger ideas in a non-intimidating way. Mm, that's nice. Yeah, I love that. And especially, you know, because this apologetics is such an interesting degree because it is study, it is academic study, and yet so much of it is geared toward that lay audience. And so it's sort of thinking about how do you translate, you know, all of this to people who maybe haven't studied it. So yeah, thank you so much for that. So kind of moving on, um, kind of continuing that, what do you see as some of the distinctions, some of the distinct differences between popular audience 
and a specialized one, especially as you're thinking about the considerations that you have to make as a writer, like specifically, practically speaking, what is it that you do with regards to vocabulary, tone, how you frame it, you know, those kinds of things that might help our students. Yeah. Um, so the first thing um, that I'm going to point out, because I struggle with it, mm -hmm. is jargon. <laughs> So jargon is those specialized words to an individual field, um, and they're words that generally people outside the field won't understand. Mm -hmm. So like the word epistemology, you know, a lot of people won't understand what that is uh, and may be intimidated by it. So, and I've actually been kind of, like I said, I've been accused of using some jargon in, in some of my popular writing, some jargon. I've actually <laughs> <laughs> had some popular level writers read some of my works and try to clear it out for me. Um, That's nice. so yeah, um, when you write for a broader audience, you have to leave out the jargon for the most part, um, or use it selectively and purposefully. And many times you use it with, if you're going to use some of the terms of your, you know, specialized terms in your field, then, um, for a popular audience, I include a glossary of terms or Ooh, actually nice. Yeah. And even more so than that, I've been including call out boxes right oh, on the page where they good. happen. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. It, that does two things. If you're going to use call out boxes, it's more effective because it's right there. They don't have to search for it in a glossary. Um, but it also limits how many of those terms you can use because obviously you can't put that many call out boxes in a text. Right. So, <laughs> so right. jargon is something I consider. That's one. Um, narrative is something that mm. I consider when I'm writing for a popular audience. The, the popular level audiences can relate better to narratives, um, mm -hmm. and especially when they're personal ones, when they're ones from your own story. <laughs> so with my last project, I found that more people identified with the stories I wrote near the beginning of the book mm -hmm. um, that were heavily narrated by both my husband and I back and forth, you know, talking to each other about things that had happened in the church um, and teasing each other and all that gave them an entry point into considering the bigger ideas that I was trying to communicate. So if I can communicate a bigger, deep idea in a narrative format for a popular audience, I'm going to try to do that. Uh, so it's something they can hang on to and then go deeper if they so desire. That's uh, so that's another one. I've got more. <laughs> Oh, yes, please. Anything. <laughs> and by the way, one thing I want to mention um, as you are continuing, I love how you, you are calling attention to things that you have learned, which really is something that I've been trying to emphasize in this class is that you don't just stop. Like, you're not like, I've arrived and now I'm the writer that I can be, you know, that yeah. you actually are constantly, yeah, sort of learning new ways. So I just wanted to highlight that since that is something that you, that you kind of caught attention to. Uh, yes. yes whatever you'd yes. like to share we want to hear that's actually a great point because um i have such a trouble i have such, so much trouble with perfectionism and so it's really hard for me to <laughs> hand off my book to like the world or other people or editors right. i want to i actually rewrote the first chapter of um why i still believe it was probably rewritten 20 to 25 times and oh, wow. uh yeah it's a little much by the way <laughs> <laughs> In but, eight weeks, you don't have that much time, but right. it's a nice, yeah, it's yeah. A nice um, thing to kind of, yeah, I think remind, it's a nice reminder, I think, that you're never yeah. going to get it right the first time. Right. And I'm starting to curtail that. Like, I won't do that as much in the future, but, you know, I, I joke, there's a movie called 50 First Dates, and I always call yes. this book 50 First <laughs> Chapters. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so other ideas. Um, yeah. Another thing is with a popular audience, I create a clearly defined target audience. Um, in academic writing, it's already sort of defined for you because it's the people that are interested in that specific um, study. But with a popular audience, you're dealing with so many different people from across so many different backgrounds and different th that they themselves are interested in different things. So I try to create a clearly defined target audience. Who is it that I'm actually trying to hit with this book? And I think one of the things that I've heard from students in my apologetics communications classes, they're like, well, I want to hit as many people as possible. And I'm like, that's, that is wonderful. And I appreciate that. But when you don't have a target, you're apt to hit nothing. Mm. So you really need to, you know, just go wherever and you don't have a way of framing what you're trying to say. So I'm very specific in writing um, for a certain kind of person. I even create three fictitious characters that I'm writing to, and I have their, what their desires are, what their background is. It's all fleshed out and I keep it before my eyes pretty much through the whole time I'm writing. And that, what that does is it helps me choose 
the kinds of examples I'm going to use, the metaphors, the wording, the level of language, and then how the overall book's going to flow. Oh, that's so, such great practical tips. Great. Yeah. Practical. Well, everybody in apologetics communication, when I tell them to do the target audience, they're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> like, come on, who are you trying to reach? And, and I typically keep it within a decade of age, like 30 to 40 oh, year old nice. women who are of a certain, you know, place of whatever, just, I try to, I try to flesh it all out, but, um, so, and they're like, but I don't want to just be limited to that. You won't be. My books have always hit bigger groups, but because I'm specifically targeting, um, I'm trying to hit that group, then it spreads out to other people. That's good. Yeah. Cause otherwise it might be sort of all over the place. Right. And kind of not reined in. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And it, that will really relate to a lot of it to level of language and the metaphors and examples that you use. So if I'm writing to women, I use a lot of marriage examples or mm -hmm. things that women will relate to, like being a mom, mm -hmm. things like that. Right. Um, or, or if they're not married, um, just the challenges of being a woman in, you know, in certain circles of business and academics and things like that. So I, I'll try to relate on that. But if I'm writing to a more general audience, then I'm not going to use those like female specific examples. Right. Great. Wonderful. Do you want to move on to the next question or do you have more? Um, I do have one more, which is academic. Yes, I want to hear it. Yes, please. So, um, the, you know, when you're going towards a specialized academic audience, obviously there's an expectation of substantiating all your claims. <laughs> okay. right? I put most. No, really, it's all your claims. <laughs> so, and you do that through argumentation such as Aristotelian syllogisms and exposition on the analysis, uh, exposition on or analysis of your text and other research. So there's, you know, there's typically, th this is a little different because there's typically a singular question you're trying to answer and, and you flesh it out to however many pages you can, you know, do that to the nth degree. So there's going to be a lot of heavy footnoting and referencing. And I, the reason I brought this up is because I am, a, I'm like a pathological footnoter. <laughs> I, I'm constantly trying to footnote things and give people resources. But in the popular level, you really got to stay away from that in your books and, um, you know, do endnotes um, and include for further reading. Very different from academic where you really are trying to substantiate everything right there as you go through uh, page by page. That's good. Yeah, good distinction. And this is sort of related to the next question, the, the different audiences. Um, oh, yeah. This is kind of asking a little bit more for specific examples, if you've ever done that, if you've ever written um, on the same topic for different audiences, and then what that might look like, how have you adjusted, like, you know, kind of what you've talked about just now, but maybe giving a more specific example. Is there anything like that? Oh, yeah. So I, I mentioned I did a master's thesis on the copycat um, aspect of the Christ myth theory, and so that subject I did academically. Um, and then I, I found that it was something people kept asking me about. They wanted me to write on it for a popular level. They wanted to give presentations on it. So I have used the same topic in many different areas. So I can kind of flesh that out a little bit. Um, the language I use, of course, like I've been saying, is affected by the reading level of the audience. So I've written for academic, I've written for mixed apologetics audiences, for women's audiences, and then like for youth. And so obviously that's going to be mm. vastly different on the language levels. Um, uh, for academics, um, obviously that's like my postgraduate learners. They don't require as many visual metaphors nor concrete examples, although that can be helpful. Um, it, it, you know, it, it makes, it breaks up the, the writing in a little bit. I've read some academics who are just dry as dirt <laughs> and it's not enjoyable. That is not you, Mary Beth. It's not your book with David. I hope not. <laughs> no, yours was fun. You actually threw in a lot of metaphors. We added and, a lot of jokes. <laughs> yeah, a lot of jokes, which yes. I appreciate and so do other academics. So there you go. <laughs> but it's not as important, I think, to right. help people understand. Right. right. Um, Mixed apologetic audiences, I'm going to keep my language. Uh, mixed apologetic, I'm sorry, that's going to be adult, um, maybe conference attenders that are coming okay. for an apologetics conference or are uh, um, people who are into the niche of apologetics books. So mm. they're picking up my book because they know that I do this, you know, in apologetics. So I, at those books, I'm going to keep the language at a college level with a few graduate level jumps um, okay. and include some more concrete examples or metaphors, a few more visual metaphors, 
uh, more explicit language. I mean, I don't mean that as in like rude language, but just right. very, very right. clear. Yeah. Um, Making sure you really clearly define what you're saying. Right. Yeah. And um, when I get out of just writing, when I get into um, now I have to present it, I'm going <laughs> to, this is funny, but I tend to present my more masculine side. Like I wear pants and I just kind of keep it very neutral um, in its presentation. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> I, well, I love pants. this. And, and this is exactly um, the kind of thing because of your background and I'm learning so much too, even from, from this talk, um, that you really do have such practical advice to offer. Um, so kind of leading into the next one, you enjoy this. This is something that you really do find as your calling and, you know, really has become, you know, your way of life. Um, what do you find most gratifying about that writing for a popular audience um, or just of writing more generally? And then, so this is sort of like your personal enjoyment, personal enrichment, but then um, how do you see that as connected to the mission of apologetics, the idea of writing, presenting ideas? How is that, um, yeah, a ministry, apologetic ministry? I, you know, as you were asking me the question, like I have some thoughts and then this other thought came to my head and I was like, oh, do I really enjoy writing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this. Yes, there, please. <laughs> I've talked to other authors, um, some friends of mine that also write popular level apologetics works as well as academic. And a few of us are not, like we're speakers who also write. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. okay. And I think that's, I, I do enjoy it. I've always enjoyed writing. I, I remember winning a, a poetry contest as a fifth grader, but uh, I, I enjoy it, but I don't think it's like super enjoy that's the thing I always want to do um I think I do it because I'm an educator and that's one of the things like what's the most gratifying aspect of writing for popular audiences uh I have an undergrad in music education so I'm an educator at heart mm -hmm. and I love seeing people learn I love yeah. seeing them have epiphany moments and, and that's just extremely gratifying mm -hmm. like being able to walk with somebody on a journey of learning so knowing that the knowledge that I have learned was being effectively utilized to help someone else on their faith journey was, that's extremely rewarding. So that's like one of the reasons that I, I really do it, even though I'm a little bit more of a verbal processor. Mm -hmm. um, and on that note, I tend to use dictate, even though it's not, oh, it's not gotten to a, yeah, yeah, like it's not gotten up to the level that I don't have to go back and correct a lot of things. But uh, when I really get stuck in writing bigger works, sometimes I'll dictate instead of, um, and which is the, where you speak it and the computer writes it out rather than typing it out. So if, you know, just a little side note, if you do, if you are a verbal processor, but you also want to write like sort of like me, um, then that's a good way to go about it. If you get stuck, just start dictating. Yeah. Great. So uh, that's one of the gratifying aspects is the see, you know, knowing that I was hitting the right or seeing that I hit my audience, my target, and that they're learning through it. So the responses that they get and then um, the education that I get from hearing the responses to the writing is very um, satisfying as well. Now, my mission, uh, how do I see the activity as like right. sort of fulfilling the mission? <laughs> it's to, I'm laughing because I just said like, hey, I don't like to write. <laughs> and now, I'm, well, what's the mission of it? I do like to write. I shouldn't say that, but it's just a um, I'll hold it in tension. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> well, it's interesting because in my question, I had asked what's the most gratifying. And then I sort of shifted over into enjoyment. And I liked how you sort of tease those two out because they're not exactly the same. You can feel like something is gratifying, that it actually does hit the right spot. You know, as you had said, you're an educator and you kind of that is rewarding. Yeah. But it, yeah, it takes work. It takes effort. And so, um, yeah, the reward is costly, but that's okay. That's okay. It's worth it. It's valuable. So thank there you me. go. That's a good way of fleshing that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I had, I had noticed that I had done that and it wasn't intentional. Um, <laughs> as you were talking, I was like, Oh, oops. <laughs> Sorry. <about that." laughs> I think it's, I think it's a really good point because I think people, Think this is you know they hear all these things that are floating in their head like 
everything that you should that you do should be worship of God. And that is true, but we romanticize that and we think we're gonna have this amazing experience while we're writing and we're just gonna be so worshipful. And sometimes it's like pulling your hair out. And <laughs> I mean sometimes you write What's stuff and then word? yeah, I, I've written stuff just to get it out and then it's never been put in print. Like there's right. stuff that right. and, and that's I don't know, maybe it is worship, but it's just like don't romanticize it. I think that's where I was going. <laughs> that's nice. I like that. I like that. That's good. So I will get to mission. Um, how does this serve? You know, how does this serve yes. our mission as apologists? Um, well, the first one, so I always break apologetics up into like sort of offering the defense of the reason of our hope and then also answering objections that oh, are raised. Right. Yeah. So in, um, in the first one, offering a defense of the reason of our hope, I mean, apologetics writing introduces people to the arguments for God's existence and for Jesus as the risen savior, right? And that's the great hope in Christianity. So when people are saying, you know, they use the first Peter 3.15, uh, you know, a passage of scripture in order to say like, you should always be prepared. Well, to do what? And it's to explain the great hope. So when you're writing these arguments out, you might be you might be helping some people see what, how do I do that? How do I enact first Peter three fifteen, mm. and always be prepared. So that's, that's one of the things I help. I think writing these arguments out and writing in apologetics really helps fulfill that, that command. Um, because some people have may not have previously known that these arguments exist or how strong the arguments can be. Right. And, um, that's really important. That's, Actually, my last book, I was hoping to break into, I was hoping to bring apologetics into areas, um, into book genres where it hasn't typically been. So I was trying to get a little bit, a different audience to explore and encounter apologetics. Um, so that's part of the, you know, like helping them think critically and exposing them to this whole life of the mind is right. part of why we do this. And then of course, to answer objections to, you know, against God um, it can really, and this is what I've seen in my writing, apologetics writing really helps those who have had doubt uh, brought on mm, by the questioning right. of their faith and it, they need to be exposed to what the arguments are. So like, I have a doubt, does God really exist? Does he really care about me? Why is there pain and suffering in the world? And so by writing these things from our own unique perspectives, especially, uh, it can help relate to somebody who has had that similar doubt or that, you know, or even just maybe that hasn't had that doubt, but has been doubting other places and they can hear your story. They can hear how you work through it. And that gives them sort of a safe space to encounter their own objections mm. and their doubts. So it, it really does serve the mission of the apologist to do this kind of popular level writing. That's great. Yeah. And you even talked about your own um, background in it and how it sort of started with this is like, you know, kind of you know, small beginnings that really blossomed out of that, um, you know, you felt compelled to write on, you know, defending the resurrection and explaining it and write, and then it sort of all kind of ballooned. I love that. I love that. Yeah. So we're getting ready to wrap this up. And again, thank you so much for your time. Um, as we close, I just wanted to ask you, what would you want to leave these students with, you know, they're kind of, most of them will be just be beginning the program. Um, what, what is it that, what charge, what advice, what, um, what word would you give them? <laughs> How about five? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> what words? <laughs> right. Five words. All right. Yes. So let's try to do this. Like I'll do them in short form. Um, but the first thing I wanted to say is that be sure that the thing to which you are most attentive is your own relationship with God. Mm, um, so right. whatever you do with your degree in ministry uh, and in your writing, it should really be reflective of your own personal development and growth. Mm. Because there, there's sort of a tendency in um, writing to just sort of write the arguments, write this, you know, whatever, but not let people see how it affects you personally or how you struggled. And, um, you know, there's been some ministries lately where the person has been like mm. all apologetics arguments, but then we find out they're not really a good person. And mm. I don't want to see that happen to anybody, um, especially any of our graduates. So make sure you're writing from your own development. Mm. That's the first one. 
Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, find a way to use your degree for the sake of others. So um, I started in my apologetics degree for my own, answering my own doubts. But then I realized, I mean, I'm an educator, but I realized, hey, if I have these doubts, then other people do. So I started serving in my own local church, teaching an apologetics class. So that may be what it looks like for you. You might start an online ministry or a journal or a debate group or something, but you know, find a way to use your knowledge that you're gaining for the sake of others. Mm -hmm. That's two. <laughs> uh, three, don't be afraid to try things and fail. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people are afraid of failing. I know I was as a perfectionist and uh, I have, I have an original podcast from like 2010, 11, somewhere in there that nobody knows about because it failed because I couldn't <laughs> keep up with it. <laughs> so um, I think a lot of people are worried that if they do something and it fails, that, that they'll never get another chance. And that's just not true. So um, make sure you try things. Good. Okay. So we're on three. Let's do four. Don't be afraid to carry on into academic work. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been talking about writing for popular audiences and academic audiences. And I just want to encourage some of you uh, we do need Christian researchers and thinkers at the highest levels to continue to push our knowledge. So uh, please do not be afraid to explore PhD work and where you might add to the academic body of knowledge. Um, very important. And then the last one, be attentive to where there's a lack of attention in writing. Uh, look for the holes in apologetics. What are we missing? So when I was in my master's degree, I saw a lack of engagement with the pagan myth theory. And I was kind of laughed at for a bit by academics because they figured it a dead argument as of the 1980s. Like, I mean, Ronald Nash, Edwin Yamauchi, these guys destroyed that argument in the 80s. But I saw it everywhere. Uh, it was just flourishing in all these non-academic forums. Mm -hmm. um, so, and eventually, that argument actually seeped its way back up to uh, academic work. Mm. Um, so where you heard it from guys like Richard Dawkins, uh, the Oxford biologist. So, it, it, you know, it was an area that was needed to, we needed to have some coverage of it again. And in other, you know, in other words, summing up, look for the holes. Where, what are we missing? Uh, where could there still be work in apologetics rather than just taking everything that's already out there and then that's nice. doing it again? Yes. Yeah, let, let's find some new things that yes. we haven't attended to. That, that, that really fits with um, some of the stuff that I've been encouraging um, in this class, that apologetics, there are established arguments. Yes, mm -hmm. and you should know those, but God has called you. It's dynamic, and um, yeah. you yeah. are brought here to um, kind of bring your background to bear, your study to bear on um, this, your perspective, your insights. So yeah, definitely. And that that connects with the do not be afraid to fail thing. You said that you, you know, people were sort of like, like, what are you doing with this? Yeah. <laughs> but it actually did go somewhere. So you kind of trusted your insights, you know, not that you, you know, shouldn't listen to your professors or anybody <laughs> else. I mean, definitely take those things into account. But if something is burning in your heart, I think, yeah, there's probably, there's probably something to explore and, yeah. you know, maybe it'll fail. Maybe it won't go anywhere, but definitely, definitely try it out. But yeah. Guys, and I loved that. That was fantastic. <laughs> By the way, it wasn't my professors that were discouraging me. It was just a broader, oh, yeah. like some other okay. academics. <laughs> okay, and and it ended up being something I wrote about academically for collections of apologetics oh, books. So anyway, yeah. But yeah. yeah. And I love that sort of um, the interaction, you know, between the academic and the um, more popular level, which is so connected to what we've been talking about this time. So thank yeah. you. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I, um, I know that this will be very helpful for the students.